So, Mark, tell us about this script and your inspiration. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't even remember writing it. What? In a way. It's kind of weird, right? Like, I wrote it five years ago, and um, I, don't, I don't really remember what my inspiration was. I, I, uh, I have another film that I made in 2012 that's also a South Boston thing, so I think it's kind of an offshoot of, of that, and... Um, like, I don't really know where, where it came from. Like, it's, it's kind of weird because, like, when I think back, I'm like, what inspired me to do this? Like, it was just kind of it, it's one of those things that just kind of started by itself, I guess, which is, uh, you know, interesting. Some of them for me start that way and some of them don't. But, yeah, like, I don't remember saying, this is a story I need to tell. Um, and then, you know, you go back and look at it and you're like, yeah, okay, like, it's all here. But, like, where did, like who are these people? Where did they come from? So, I don't know. It's kind of, uh, this one's a little bit of interesting magic. For me so it's kind of fun all right well uh thanks for being here man um i will be playing the obvious character randy <laughs> uh and then the agents and the mixed in, yeah. in matched amongst everybody so it's not obvious at all <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah 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 um so <laughs> let's get started candace on your call all right exterior boston's logan airport day a man exits the airport terminal through sliding doors. He drags a bag behind him. He is in his late 20s, muscular and wiry, black Irish. He is dirty and unkempt. His hair is cropped close, but he needs a shave. Scars crisscross his face. He is Billy McCarthy. As he scans his surroundings, a cab pulls up. He quickly drags his bag over and motions to the driver. The trunk pops. Billy tosses the bag in and surveys his surroundings once again. He slams the trunk, opens the cab's rear door, and slides in. Intro cab day, the cabbie turns to Billy. Where to, buddy? Oh, Colin Avenue. Southie? Yeah. The cab pulls away. If you don't mind me saying, it looks like you've been away or something. Seven years, nine months. I did some time myself back in the day. What'd you do? A lot of things. Billy stares out the window. They drive. You here for our business or pleasure? What do you think? Billy smirks. That's what I figured. Always business if we're coming back to Saudi. Exterior Route 93 day. Hip hop beats kick hard. The cab heads past Boston landmarks. The windmills, the water tank. The highway opens up before them. Billy twiddles his fingers. His hands finds its way into his jacket. He unzips an interior pocket and pulls out a small flash drive. He rolls it around on his fingertips. On the side of the drive, the name McCarthy is inscribed in black marker. Billy's eyes light up. A small smirk crosses his face. He places the drive back into the inner pocket and zips it closed. Billy closes his eyes and leans back into the seat. A title card appears on screen. Absent without official leave. Exterior diner day. The cab pulls up curbside. Billy pops out, grabs his bag from the trunk, and fishes a roll of money from it. He passes several bills to the cabbie through the open window. Hundred bucks? That's some good business going on. Billy peels more bills off the wad and hands them over. You never saw me. Buddy, I ain't never seen nobody. Billy grabs his bag and drags it across the curb. The cab zips off. Billy turns and notices a familiar face. Paco, you still hanging out here? Paco, 30s, ponytail, druggy type, is chatting with another stoner. Paco gives Billy knuckles, then grabs him for a quick bro hug. Oh, yeah, bro. How you been? How's your mom? You feeling good? Yeah, feel good. Billy opens the diner door and drags his bag inside. Interior diner day, Billy sits in a booth. The large menu in his hands covers his face. A waitress approaches, a world weariness emanates from her with every step. Her dreads bounce under her head wrap. She is Camille, <laughs> mid forties of African lineage, yoga muscles. What can I get you? Billy speaks with a over the top South Boston accent. Yeah, toots, uh, let me get some eggs over easy and some toast and all that. And don't screw it up. Camille rolls her eyes and sighs. Yeah, coming up. 
She scribbles on her pad and starts to slink away. Mel, it's me. She spins. Billy? He drops the menu and smirks. Oh my lord, boy. Where have you been? It's hard to get vacation time, you know? She leans in and kisses him on the cheek. She quickly pulls away and looks about. He brushes his hand over her arm. You okay? Mm, yes. She studies him carefully. I don't believe you. She turns to leave. Eat up and get out of here before people start talking. I don't need attention or drama. Billy smirks. It's been years. No one remembers. Are you kidding me? You and I were the biggest news story Salty ever saw. Lovely. Your memory sucks. She starts away. Mel, one favor. She pauses and turns back. What, honey? Do you know where Ellie is? Oh, you mean that bitch, Lang Nook? Her name's Ellie. I had her in class. Her name was always Lang Nook on my roster. Just tell me where she is. He sighs. Oh, Brian's. A dump? Bitten for a little whore like her. Camille reaches for her order pad. She scribbles something on it. Sorry, I'm being petty. I know. It's okay. Camille tears a page off and hands it to Billy. I'm off at seven. She turns and walks off. He takes the paper and slips it into his jacket pocket. Interior diner day. A diner patron reads a newspaper. The headline, Middle East tension, civilian casualties pile up. Billy's eyes catch a glimpse of it as he wipes up egg yolk with his last bit of toast. Pops the toast into his mouth and takes a slug of coffee. He looks at the bill, finishes his coffee, thumbs through his wallet, and puts $250 on the table. He places the mug on top of it, stands, grabs his bag, and drags it behind him as he exits the diner. Exterior diner day. Billy stands in front of the diner. The world speeds by him as he stands frozen in time. The sound of the city grows louder and louder. Bombs explode in his mind, cut to black. Interior mom's living Living room day. The doorbell rings. A moment passes. It rings again. A male voice calls from upstairs. Hold on a second. A moment later, a man trots down the stairs. He is Mac. Late 30s, tired, wiry build. He unlocks the deadbolt, grabs the knob, and swings the door open. Billy stands before him. Holy crap! Mac grins from ear to ear. Holy crap. Hey, Mac. What are you doing here? H how'd you get here? Mac stares. Billy chuckles. Do I get to come in or what? Sure, sure. Wow. My little brother is home. Mac holds the door open. Billy enters. He tosses his jacket over the back of a chair. He lays his bag beside it. They embrace. Mac slaps Billy's back with great enthusiasm. Mom will be so happy. Hey, you got a computer? I need to do something quick. Uh, Randy's old room. Mac gestures. Billy heads out of the room. Mac shouts after him as he steps towards the kitchen. You want a beer? Billy calls back from across the house. No, thanks. I'm having one. Mac chuckles and steps out of the room. Billy calls out. Hey, you need to upgrade this thing. It's a freaking dinosaur. So buy me a new one. Mac returns, holding a tall can of beer. Billy steps back into the room. Mac cracks his beer open and sips. Are you a computer guy now? Uh, yeah, kinda. Hey, are you supposed to be drinking? Uh, Doc said one's okay. I only ever have one. Mac makes his way to the couch. Billy looks around. Copious knickknacks adorn shelves. An old solid state TV sits on a cart. A worn carpet is underfoot. Billy picks up a religious statuette and smirks. Hasn't changed a bit. Max sits. They're going eight years. What's going to change or didn't change in the 20 before that? Good point. Max sips the beer. Billy scans the room. Thank you. For what? 
taking care of mom. She was a good woman. Billy nods. Mac raises his can. To Ma. He hoists his can and sips a toast. What about services? The funeral parlor scheduled everything. Uh, we had it all planned in the living will. Pay for it in advance. Easy. Cool. Less stress. Yeah. I'm going to get something for everyone at the hospital. The doctors and nurses, even like the janitors, they all were amazing. A big cake. What do you think? It always feels good when someone says thanks. I'll do it in the morning. Remind me. Okay. I'm glad it was a stroke and not that cancer. She fought for years and never got her. She beat it. Yeah. Billy takes a breath. You sacrificed a lot. Mac fidgets. Is why Maureen left? Uh, I mean, who, who could blame her, right? Uh, she hated living here. No one wants to be married to mama's boy. Weird. I don't miss her. I thought I would. I never even think about her. Mac chuckles. Well, the family was going to go to hell after dad bailed. But you kept it all together. Yeah. Well, I didn't do a good enough job. Randy is who he is. I guess. Heard from him? Not since I kicked him out. Billy puts a hand on Mac's arm. Nobody was going to change him. He was always a troubled kid. Thanks for everything you've done. The family owes you a lot. Oh, Jesus. When did you get in touch with your feelings? Max chuckles with embarrassment. I've seen a lot. It uh, makes you think. You never know when your number's gonna get called. You need to speak your mind and live with truth. Yeah. You doing okay? You know. I don't. Tell me. A bunch of new meds. I feel pretty decent for the last few months. You always take them? Come on, you know me. I follow the doctor's orders. They know what they're doing. Okay. You didn't used to. I know, but I need to now. It's worse. Mac's eyes pop around the room. Hey, enough of this. Tell me some crazy stuff. Billy stands. I'm going to grab a shower and some Z's. I'm fried. I'll tell you some more stories later, okay? I promise. Yeah, of course. Billy heads upstairs. The phone rings. Mac steps into the hallway area and pulls the phone from its cradle. Hello? Oh, hey, Kate. Yeah. When's that? Four to seven? No flowers, okay? She wanted donations to Dana Farber instead. Oh, you, you won't believe this. Billy's here. I don't know, but he's here. Interior bathroom day. Water cascades over Billy as he pours shampoo into his palm. Closes his eyes as he lathers it through his hair. Bombs explode in his mind. He snaps back to reality with eyes wide open. He inhales deeply as water and soap cascade down his body. Interior, Billy's bedroom day. Billy flops on the bed. Rockets fire and bombs explode in his head. The noises of the world grow to a dissonant crescendo and overwhelm his reality, cut to black. Interior, mom's living room, evening. Mac is seated before a TV as Billy bounces down the stairs. I need to head up. You got a kick? Uh, take my eyes. He stands, crosses the room, and fishes through a candy dish. She won't be needing them, right? Billy she approaches. Mac hands him a key ring. She loved us a lot. Doesn't make it any easier. They hug. Billy gives Mac a fob punch to the face. They laugh. And I used to beat the crap out of you when we were kids. 
you could cripple me in like one second now, I bet. Yes, I absolutely could. Billy pantomimes a karate chop. They chuckle. Billy grabs his jacket. I'll be back late. You going where I think you're going? Probably. Don't call me for backup. <laughs> I won't. See you in the morning. Billy opens the door and steps out. He closes it behind him. Matt points at the screen and laughs out loud at something on TV. Interior dive bar evening. Bartenders pull taps, beer flows. Patrons gab and drink. In the corner, darts puncture the board. Ellie, Vietnamese, slight, pours shots and spreads them across the bar in front of the rowdy regulars. She pours one for herself. She slugs her shot back and slams the glass down on the bar. She spins and her eye catches something. A lone figure sits in the corner booth. It is Billy. She grabs a fellow bartender by the arm. I need to take five. Ellie stares across the room. Interior corner of bar evening. Ellie slips into the booth. Billy sits across from her with a half empty glass of Coke. What are you doing here? Hi, Ellie. It's great to see you too. I told you to never. Things are different now. He smiles a friendly smile. You can just show up. Is this really the way you greet the guy you were going to marry? I have some party now. Who works here? So? I'm an old friend in from out of town. You don't know any men besides him. You cheated on me. This her. You admitted it. Yep. And you, you told me you wouldn't go away again. You swore to me. I'm sorry. You're a piece of crap, Billy. I'll never forget you. Forgive me. Billy sips his Coke. His smile is still friendly. Even if I don't mean anything to you, you still mean a tremendous amount to me. I'm coming to terms with a lot of things. I understand myself and my actions as well as the impact it's had on you and everyone else. Ellie looks around. He needs to go. He's going to be here. I understand. I'm not here to cause trouble. <laughs> That's the only thing you know to, how to do. Billy stands. He takes a few steps, then turns back. I'll only be here for a couple of days. I hope you'll have a minute to talk before I'm gone. I won't. He turns and walks away. She watches him open the door and exit. Exterior, Camille's building, night. Billy looks at the order pad slip. On it is written an address and buzzer number. He tucks the slip into his pocket, climbs the steps, and buzzes. A voice crackles through the intercom. Who is it? It's me. The door buzzes open. He steps inside and glides up the stairs. Interior, Camille's living room night. In a darkened room, Camille and Billy sit closely on the couch. She runs her hands over him. How did she get hurt? I can take care of myself. That's not what I asked. Those scars. She lightly touches his face. They share a light kiss. I thought I'd never see you again. You knew I'd come back. I didn't think you'd come find me. Of course I would. Why? You left me for that bitch. I'll start again. I'm sorry. I thought I would be over it, but I'm still angry. You broke my heart. I know. You were in love with her. Yeah. I know everyone thought I was some desperate loser sleeping with her minor student, but I was in love with you. I guess I still, I'm in a way. I know. It was all worth it. Everything. Losing my job, being hated by everyone, getting abused in the press. It was worth it. Is that messed up? Is it worth it now? Mostly. I'm making enough money. People stopped calling me names and looking at me funny a while ago. I don't remember the last time anyone was pretty pentit whore on the front of my house. So I'm okay. I'm 
sorry you had to deal with that. Did you love me? Yes. I don't know. It was just too much to be with you. And then with the media? You were amazing and incredible and sexy as hell, but I think the real problem wasn't the storm around us. 15 years was a huge age difference. I was still a kid. I didn't know anything about the world. You do now? Yeah. Oh, baby. I'll bet you do. They kiss. Interior Camille's bathroom night. Billy zips his fly and flushes the toilet. He turns on the faucet and runs the water. He opens the medicine cabinet and quickly rifles through it. He pulls out an aspirin bottle, opens it, dumps the contents into the toilet and flushes again. Camille calls from the other room. You okay? Yeah. Billy fishes into his pocket and pulls out the flash drive. He drops it into the aspirin bottle, followed by a half handful of coins. He pokes it into the medicine cabinet, pulls out some Vaseline and opens the container. He spreads a large smear of the petroleum jelly around the threaded neck of the aspirin bottle and screws the cap on tightly. He puts the Vaseline away, then lifts the back of the toilet tank. He drops the aspirin bottle into the water and it sinks out of sight. He replaces the lid of the tank, washes his hands and exits. Interior, Camille's bedroom night. Camille and Billy lay naked under the sheets. His bare shoulders are covered with odd, short, and scratchy tattooed lines. That was incredible. He kisses her lightly. I've had some practice since I was 17. You've been with a lot of women. Quality over quantity, you know? She laughs and playfully slaps his chest. <laughs> Dirty boy. She snuggles up. Ellie, was she quality? She chuckles. Yeah. He smiles. I'll bet you please her. Yeah, I guess so. You must have pleased her a lot. Her hands run over his skin. You're the one being naughty, I think. Mm. Hmm. Camille's hands and lips are all over him. You must have pleased her so much that she'd want to have your baby, that she would poke a hole in a condom so she would get pregnant. You must have pleased her so much that she wanted to trap you forever. Billy sits bolt upright. What? You didn't know? Billy jumps out of bed and begins to dress. I'll see you tomorrow. You're a bitch. No. I'm telling you what the real bitch did. Screw you, Camille. Billy turns. His back is covered in a strange repeated tattoo pattern, four vertical marks with a slash through them. The traditional way of marking off fives. The fives cover his back and count into the hundreds. He finishes dressing, turns, and storms out. Interior dive bar night. The establishment is empty, save for a lone figure. It is Jim, the owner, white bro type, 30s, well put together. He shuffles paperwork over the bar and sips whiskey. The door to the back room swings open. In walks a Southie kid, young 20s, white, dressed in a cliche hip hop look. He has impossible to ignore tattoos on his face. Jim does not, doesn't look up. Suck my sweetheart. I told you no more. I need vehicles that people actually want. The kid squirms. I thought the high-end ones were still okay. No. You need to listen. Jim exits. The kid looks at the paperwork on the bar and plays with Jim's drink. Jim returns a moment later with an envelope. He drops it on the bar. You shorted me on quality. I'm shorting you on money. The kid sighs. Sorry. Jesus. I need a BMW 5 Series by Thursday. Okay. The kid grabs the money bag. Are those tracks coming? They're fire, yo. Better be. The kid exits to the back. Jim calls after him. 5 Series by Thursday. Exterior dive bar night. Billy tries the door. It's locked. He bangs loudly, then again. He breathes deeply and looks around. The parking lot is empty. 
He pounds the door again. It swings open. In the doorway stands Jim. We're closed. I need to see Ellie. Hi, you're Billy. Are you from town? I'm Jim, Ellie's better half. Jim holds the door and motions for Billy to enter. Billy steps in. Jim follows. Interior, dive bar night. Jim closes and locks the door behind them. I'm a good boss. Send her home early, whether we're busy or not. She checks on the baby before she goes to sleep. They stroll up to the bar. What do you think? He spreads his arms displaying the bar. It's a dank hole. You're still selling coke out of the stock room? <laughs> no, that was the previous owner. Bless his soul. Jim motions for Billy to sit. Billy drops onto a stool. No more five dollar blowjobs in the men's room? Say it ain't so. Jim steps behind the bar. Well, Bill, the way I see it, I'm gonna make a lot of money. He grabs a bottle and two glasses and pours. This neighborhood isn't nearly the ghetto it was even a few years ago. He slides a glass to Billy. Billy eyes it. No, oh, thanks. No, I'm not going to charge you for it. I don't drink. Jim shrugs. He drinks his shot. Renovations start next month. This will soon be the best gastro pub in the city. See, nowadays there are people living here who are not alcoholics and scales and white trash on the welfare dole. Doctors, lawyers, bankers, techies, they're going to be spending money here. I'm going to clean up. You're a regular kingpin. I like the sound of visionary. Jim grabs a shoddy port for Billy and drinks it. So what does a classy guy like you want with a dot-ranked townie skank like Ellie? Like most of your ilk. She wants more than this. She gets it. Jim pours another drink. I want to see my kid. Jim slugs the booth, booze and laughs. He points to the bottle as he exits to the back. Feel free to pour one if you change your mind. Billy stands and paces. He slides up on one of the tables. His fingers trace along the surface. Billy plus Ellie is scratched into the surface. Billy spins as Jim speaks. The return was inevitable, so I had this written up. He tosses a short sheaf of papers onto the bar. Billy approaches. Not like you and your kind. I don't need to solve problems with violence. He pushes the papers to Billy. I solve problems with money. Billy frowns as he reads. $250,000. You sign away your parental rights, you go away. You never have to worry about the kid, and I'll never have to worry about you. Win win. No. Well, then you're going to be in a world of trouble. In a flash, Billy reaches up at the bar and grabs Jim by the throat. Jim chokes out his words. You think I'm afraid of you? No. You're too stupid to understand how dangerous I am. Jim chokes. Noise comes from the back. My guys are here for the bank. They're off-duty cops. Billy releases Jim and gives him a little, about, a little shove. He steps backwards towards the door. The off-duty cop bodyguards enter. Jim struggles to regain his composure. It's in the safe. Jim's bodyguards stare. Everything okay, Jimbo? I'm good. Jim's bodyguards stare for a second and exchange suspicious glances. Jim waves them away. They exit to the back. I'm going to see my kids, and you can't do a damn thing about it. Billy unlocks the door and opens it. Jim struggles to catch his breath and coughs out his words. Be sorry you ever met me. Billy scoffs and exits. Exterior. Dive bar night. Billy stands in the parking lot. The cars on Dot Avenue rush by him at hyper speeds. A black sedan with two black suit clad men passes. Billy stands frozen in time. The sounds of the day buzz through his ears and well into a cacophony. He hears helicopters, explosions, gunfire, screams, cut to black. Exterior, mom's house, night. Billy approaches the house. 
there is a dirty and disheveled old man limping up the front walk. Yo, buddy. The man ignores him and continues up the walk. You can't be here. You gotta go, okay? The old man turns. It is Brendan McCarthy, 65, white hair, thin, disheveled. Billy is frozen in his tracks. That? The old man squints. Which one are you? He peers in. <laughs> Billy boy. <laughs> yeah. Billy steps forward. <laughs> You're a good boy. Always do your homework. <laughs> what do you want? What the hell? What the hell do you do with those shrubs? Billy stands silent. Brendan pokes at the bushes. They're all different. Did they die? Nah, you cut them. They look terrible. You need to go. <laughs> go. <laughs> That's what I do best. Be gone. Don't you ever come back. I'll call the cops. <laughs> You'll go to jail forever. <laughs> you can't be here. Mac. <laughs> a little man with little plans. A failure, just like his dear father. Brendan pokes Billy in the chest. Go. No! Billy steps back. I worked my hands to the bone to buy this house. You think you're going to take it away from me? Billy recoils. I'll kill you right here. Brendan smirks and chuckles. <laughs> I have a lawyer. He stumbles past Billy, pulls a pint bottle from his jacket and sips. Billy turns to watch him walk away. Exterior, back entrance to mom's house night. Billy turns the key and opens the door. He steps into the house. Cut to interior mom's kitchen night. Billy flops down into a chair. He stares into space. The room swirls about him. Cut to interior mom's kitchen night. Billy pulls some things out of the fridge, bread, cheese, roast beef. He throws a sandwich together and stares out the window. He exits the room, leaving the sandwich and ingredients on the counter. Cut to interior mom's bathroom night. Billy pulls open the medicine cabinet. A dozen or more prescription bottles line the shelves. Wow. Billy takes a bottle into his hand. The label reads, Halidol, take every four hours. Cut to interior mom's kitchen night. Billy opens the fridge and replaces the sandwich fixings. Several cans of beer catch his eye. He hesitates. He grabs a soda. He closes the fridge. Interior computer room night. Billy sits in front of the computer and bites into his sandwich. He types into the web browser, Randy McCarthy. He scrolls through the results, nothing grabs his eye. He tries again with Randy Rage, nothing. He hits keys. A window pops up, Internal Revenue Service. He enters code into a field, another window opens. The information is for a person named Felicia Wynn show, showing an age of seven years. A social security number mother is listed as Lan Nyok Win, AKA Ellie, father is unknown. Billy closes the window and enters code. Ellie's social networking profile pops up. He clips on photos. He is denied. A pop-up message says private. He closes the browser and opens a new window. He types in obscure computer code. Ellie profile pops up on the screen. Billy clicks her photo link. It opens a page with many photos of Ellie with a young girl. Billy leans forward. His eyes widen. The young girl smiles out at him. Billy stares into the screen. The world flashes before him. Cut to interior Billy's bedroom night. Moonlight illuminates Billy's asleep in bed. Mac walks by the open door and returns a minute later with a glass of water. He pops two capsules and follows with a drink of water. He stands in the doorway and watches Billy sleep. He sips the water again and exits. Cuts to exterior desert day. Several soldiers duck for cover behind a military vehicle as a grenade explodes immediately beside them. Billy looks over. His platoon mate, Kenji, lies several, severally injured and gushing blood. Kenji! Billy charges toward him. A grenade explodes nearby. Billy grabs Kenji's legs and begins to drag him toward cover behind the vehicle as another grenade hits. 
Billy drags the body, but Kenji's head does not follow in tow. It takes Billy a moment to realize that he is dragging Kenji's decapitated corpse. Cut to interior Billy's bedroom night. Billy screams himself awake. He sits bolt upright, covered in sweat and gasping for breath. He surveys the room and understands his surroundings. He slips out of bed and digs through his bag. Mac appears in the doorway behind him. Hey, uh, you okay? Billy turns. Yeah, weird dreams. I forgot about the big math test. Huh. I still have dreams like that. Can never leave school behind. Yeah. They stare. Why are you up? I just took my meds. Every four hours like clockwork. I haven't gotten a full night of sleep in three years. You're dedicated. They stare. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. Good night. Mac exits. Billy gets back into his bed. He pulls out a 12 inch knife with a ghastly serrated edge. He slides back into bed and places the knife onto the nightstand by him. Interior, mom's kitchen morning. Billy steps into the room. Mac mans the stove. The toaster pops up, revealing two wheat slices. Mac lifts the pan and dumps scrambled eggs onto two plates. It's coffee. Billy grabs two mugs and pours. He sits at the table as Mac presents the eggs. I always make too many eggs. I keep forgetting she's not here. So since you're here today, I finally made the right amount. Mac tosses them each a piece of toast and sits. Thanks. You were out late. A lot to catch up on. I bet. They sip coffee. Billy takes a bite of toast. Do you know what you're going to do? i got to go over to the flower shop and make sure the arrangements are ready. And get that cake. No, without mom. Are you going to, like, try and get a job? What do you want to do? I haven't, I haven't thought about it. You can start all over. I guess. Get a hobby. Hey, maybe volunteer at the Y. You like kids? You get a dog? You always talked about a dog. That sounds like a lot. My doctor said it's a simple routine is good. <laughs> Something I know I can accomplish every day. It helps the, helps the symptoms not get worse. But your routine was all about mom. You gotta do something for you. I don't know. I, I, I really don't want to change anything. Why are you giving me crap? It's too early. I want to know you're going to be okay. Look, I've been dealing with everything crumbling around me for 20 years, and I'm still here. I follow the rules. And I do it the right way. I'll be okay. Interior computer room morning. Billy sips his coffee and tires. Rips away. He fills a window with code. A browser window opens. U.S. government is clearly emblazoned at the top of the page. Billy types more code. Authorized flashes across the page. Billy pulls on a drop down menu. He selects the category enlisted. He scrolls through a list of names and settles upon Sergeant William McCarthy. He clicks on the status field and types in bereavement leave. A message flashes accepted. Input update within 24 hours. Billy types codes into the other window. A picture of Ellie and his daughter appear on screen. The child stares out at him. He reaches a finger out and touches her image. Bombs explode in his mind. He closes the browser window, stands, and exits the room. Interior diner day. Billy sits in a corner booth with a coffee. Camille catches his eye. They stare at each other for a long moment. She heads over to him. What? I need to know something. I'm not telling you anything. It's not about us. Fine. Where would a drunk ass drift this day? He shrugs. The why? No. He's way too bad off. The Capri. It's a flop house. It's a flop house now. If he's not there, then the park across the street. 
That's where the Sarah's winos crash. Thanks. Am I going to see you again? I don't know. I'm sorry. You're only sorry you didn't get what you wanted. Exterior, tough neighborhood day. Billy Hill heads down a block of broken down storefronts. Exterior Capri Hotel Day. Billy enters the hotel. A moment later, he exits, stops at the curb while cars pass, then jogs across the street. Exterior Park Day. Billy sits on a bench watching kids, parents, and old folks of all stripes stroll by. A young father sits down next to him. He calls out to his child. Be careful. He turns to Billy. <clears throat> They're fearless, huh? They crack their head open, and they only cry when you show, show them you're upset. He chuckles. Billy stares off into the distance. Kids scamper before him on the playground. Were you a handful? I got into anything I wasn't supposed to. I copied my big brother. He was a troublemaker. I wanted to be a troublemaker. He cleaned up his acts. I did too. I always wish I had a big brother to show me the ropes. My never, dad never taught me anything. He just yelled. You're not going to be like that with your kids. No way. It doesn't work. But you can't be a buddy either. It's something in the middle. Like that cool enough teacher who remembers it's what it's like to be a kid, but still bust your hump so you do your best. Sounds reasonable. And when they get a little older and they start to get it, you can't BS them. They're too smart for that. They need real answers. That was always the biggest joke to me. Like, come on, Dad. I'm not stupid. I played him so bad. They sit in silence. Why do you think a guy would just up and leave and never see his kids again? Some people can't deal with the responsibility. It freaks them out. It took me a little while, but I grew up. Please. Broads, cigars, betting on their get, eh, aim. <laughs> Bro, I don't miss any of it. Come on. Seriously, putting the wife, kids first means everything now. Like it's really what I want to do. Uh, getting up early and cooking a breakfast on Sunday, I love it. Weird, right? A lot of parents love their kids, but don't like the sacrifices. They don't see the big picture. They sit quietly. The young father gestures out towards the children. Which one's yours? I don't know. The young father is confused. Billy's eyes dart across the park. He stands, pokes into his pocket, and pulls out his wallet. He hands the young father a wad of bills. Take your buddies out for a night out on the town. Strippers, cigars, maybe even some coke. Why not, right? The whole nine and use the rest for the kids. Hey man, I don't... You're a good guy, take it. I don't need it where I'm going. Billy forces the money into the man's hands and steps away as the young father sits puzzled. Exterior, park fountain, day. Brendan McCarthy reaches into the fountain and scoops up a handful of water. He splashes his face and runs wet fingers through his hair. Besides him sits a dirty backpack. He reaches into it and pulls out a pint bottle. He takes a slug and replaces it as Billy reaches him. Billy, is that you? Yeah. You saw me last night, remember? Vaguely. Billy sits on the edge of the fountain. This is your life now? More or less. Where have you been? Baltimore, Jersey City, Pittsburgh. I like to move around. South Bronx mostly. I had a room cheap, and sometimes I'd get pretty steady work at a fish market. Make a few bucks. It's nice to have a roof over your head. But no matter what, you've always got enough for a bottle. Hey, boy -o. And why shouldn't I? What else have I got? You could have had a family. <laughs> you have a sense of humor, just like your old man. Not like Brandon Jr. He takes himself too seriously. You can't take the house. You think I'm stealing it? Let me tell you something your mother never would have told you because it would have made me look responsible and Lord knows she never wanted that to happen. 
Every time I had an extra penny, I put it towards the principal. I paid off the mortgage in half the time. Your mother's dead. She doesn't need it. I'm not taking anything from her. Mac needs it. <laughs> Again, the famous McCarthy sense of humor. Brandon steps up close to Billy and peers into his eyes. You look at me in the eye and tell you Junior needs anything more than I do. Billy hesitates and lowers, lowers his eyes. Mac, Junior, he's a schizophrenic. Help him. You, you won't even be able to keep the house. How are you going to pay the taxes? He wants the house? Tell him to make me an offer. He can't afford it. <laughs> then he's out of luck. He's your son. I have no sons. Not for 20 years. Exterior dive bar day. Billy sits on the ground against the brick wall of the bar. An unknown man steps up to him. Only his expensively shod feet are visible. As soon as he speaks, it is obvious that the man is Jim. He unlocks the front door and swings the door open. Billy looks up. Come on in. I'll make some coffee. Billy stands. They enter. Cut to interior dive bar day. A coffee mug sits on the bar. Another is placed heavily next to it. Jim points to a page of the contract. Initial it there. Billy scribbles his initials. He turns the page. Jim points. And there. Billy initials the spot. He turns the page. And stop. I signed it already. Uh, Raul the barback signed as witness. Uh, I pack barback. <laughs> Funny, right? Hilarious. You're a regular character. Billy signs the document. Over his shoulder, Ellie appears in the back room doorway. She moves about busily, then stops as she notices Billy. She looks out as he completes his signature and flips the contract pages. Jim slides a check across the bar. Thanks. Don't worry, it won't. <laughs> Billy takes the check and stands. You're not going to say thank you? Billy glares. Ellie listens in the doorway. Remember, you cash that check. You waive your rights. You will stay away from Alicia, from Ellie, from me. Clear? Crystal clear. Good. Billy looks around the room. Ellie quickly ducks behind the door jam. Billy gestures, his arms reaching out wide. Funny, though. I don't think you're afraid of that. I'll get in the way of your family. Just in the way of this. Billy tucks a check into his pocket, turns and leaves. Exterior bank day. Billy stands on the sidewalk across the street from the bank. He stands frozen in time as cars speed past him. He looks up. The bank sign hangs before him. He steps off the curb, crosses the street and enters the bank. Interior bank day. Billy approaches the customer service desk. The bank employee addresses him. Good morning. Can I help you, sir? Yeah, I uh, have a check for a decent amount of money that I need to do something with. Do you have an account? No. Okay, let me go keep the manager. Exterior dive bar day. A black sedan pulls into the parking lot. Two black suit clad agents step out and enter the bar. Interior dive bar day. Some regulars sit at the bar. Several couples sit at tables. Jim is behind the bar pouring a beer. The agents approach. I'm gonna get you guys. The agents flash badges. We're looking for a uh, lock. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Nugent? Win. Win. Jim hesitates. Uh, she's not here. Can I help you with something? Interior bank office day. In close-up, Billy Slows signs a bank document. The bank manager sits at his desk. Thank you, sir. All account information will be updated by end of day. And I can access the money? Immediately. Billy pulls the check out of his pocket. He puts it on the desk and grabs a pen. He stares as the world swirls around him. Interior diner day, Camille watches Billy enter and sits in the corner booth. 
She pulls out her phone and sends a text message. He grabs a menu and holds it up over his face. He scans the room over the top of the menu. Camille comes up behind him. You're back. Can you sit? For a second. She slides into the opposite side of the booth. How do you decide which obligations to fulfill? You fulfill one and you think that's a good thing, but it winds up hurting someone else. Like us. I wanted to be with Ellie. You wanted to be with me. I fulfilled the obligation to myself and Ellie and hurt you in the process. What do I owe myself? What do I owe Ellie? What do I owe you? You don't owe me anything. I broke your heart. That's part of the whole human puzzle, unfortunately. But I could have stayed with you and been happy enough and I wouldn't have had to hurt you in the process. It must have been, been important or you wouldn't have done it. But you were important too. Billy thinks. Mom's the only person Mac had. He's not going to make it. Everyone needs a chance to make it. So I should do whatever I can to help him. Some ways of helping are better than others. Billy pulls the check from his pocket and fidgets with it. She slips out of the booth and stands. Ellie is suddenly standing right by the booth. She's all yours. Thanks. Ellie smiles sadly. She slips into the booth as Camille steps away. I saw you at the bar in gym town. I called Camille and asked her to tell me if she saw you. She reaches her hand out. Billy pulls the check back. Thank God it didn't hurt. He stares. She reaches towards the check. Can I have it? Mac needs the money. Your daughter needs a father. She's got Jim. It's not the same. You don't want me in your life. I'm sorry. It was a shock to see you. All the anger came back. I did the wrong thing. Did you do it on purpose? Get pregnant? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me? By the time I knew for sure, you were gone. Again. I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I thought it would be better to, if you didn't know, we wouldn't have to fight. You wouldn't have to worry. She takes a breath. You can, you can still yeah. We'll figure it out, our way to have Mac. Camille is upon them. She speaks in a low, forceful voice. Billy, honey, two many black suits are outside asking about you. Did you do something? Billy is at full attention. His eyes scan the room. Where? To the left of the front door. Go out the back. Ellie is panicked. The check. Give me the check. Billy squeezes his hand on it. Billy, give it to her and go. Billy looks at her. Give it to her. He releases the check. Ellie grabs it. Go through the kitchen door. The exit's to the left of the cooler. Billy stands and turns to the back. Your brother. She gestures frantically. Mac. The other one. Randy. He's got all the money you need. There's a bookhead on Belt Avenue near one of the liquor stores. He's down there. Go. Now. The front door swings open. The two black clad agents enter. Billy takes a glimpse over his shoulder, then steps towards the back. He disappears into the kitchen while the agents show his picture to a customer at the counter. Oh, Lord boy, what have you gotten yourself into? Exterior, rear of diner, evening. Billy steps out the back door and darts down the alley. He pokes his head around the corner. He steps out and quickly walks away. Exterior, Dot Avenue, night. Billy chats with one person, then another. Each indicates that they can't help him. Billy heads down the block and chats with a local man, 50s, wearing dirty work clothes. Your are parts, please. Uh, yeah, them punk ass rappers go down there all. Go ahead. Okay. 
Ah, uh, yeah. That, them punk yeah, there all the time. Sometimes they even got limos pulling up. Limos? Yeah, they all play at being big shots, them rappers. Billy's eyes dart about. Where exactly? The corner, Minetti's place next to the liquor store. Okay. Speaking of which, I'm a little short. How about you? Billy goes into his pocket and fishes out some money. He peels off five twenties and hands them to the man. Sure, brother? I don't wanna... We're good. Billy turns and heads down Dodd Avenue. The local man counts the money again, smiling from ear to ear. Exterior auto, pot, auto parts shop night. A group of young men in cliched hip hop attire stands near the bulkhead, smoking, sipping beer from cans and paper bags, and laughing. Billy watches them for a moment and scans his surroundings. One of the young men leans down, opens the bulkhead yeah. door, steps down, disappears from sight, and closes the bulkhead behind him. Billy approaches. The young men fix their eyes on him. Billy stops, keeping his distance. Randy down there? Yeah. Yeah, Randy, who's that? Randy Rage. Men chuckle. Uh, no one here by that name, bro. Bro. <laughs> Cute. I know this is a studio. Randy McCarthy, the rapper. Yeah, he's uh, R. Jack, the destroyer now. Now, who you uh, looking for? <laughs> you gonna make me say it? R. Jack, the destroyer. That's who I'm looking for. He's my little baby brother. <laughs> His baby brother. He turns what, what to Chuckle with, with his pals. What do you want with him? Just you know, to say hi. Billy wears a smirk. He don't want to see you. We we all know his family is trash. You should go now. You... Billy drops a young man with one quick punch. The young man lies on the ground completely unconscious. Billy looks at the others. Y'all aren't as protective as him, right? Billy eyes them. They step back. He steps to the bulkhead, opens it, and disappears into the darkness. Interior basement music studio night. A hip hop track blares over huge speakers. The room is full of sound gear, mixing boards, monitors, racks of amplifiers. A synthesizer bopping to the beat and rapping along is Randy. As the cons console sits, no money, early 20s, dark skin dreads. Billy steps into the room. He stands behind them watching. The track ends. Randy celebrates. Yo, that high. <laughs> He and Mo exchange a high five. R. Jack the Destroyer and Mo Money, the greatest one to punch in today's hip hop. Randy shadow boxes. No doubt, son. Randy calls over his shoulder. What do you think, big bro? You like the track? It's pretty good, actually. Randy spins with a fury and reveals his face. He is the Southie kid that steals. Care, cars for Jim. Yo, I'm the real, I'm the real bit, man. When this track drop, it's gonna be everywhere, like last year. Not just the clubs, the radio, son. How much we go and get in this advance? Go ahead, tell him, Mr. Mo, Mo Money, greatest producer on the planet. Three, 25 large. You know who gets advances nowadays? Tell me. No one. No one. They don't pay unless they know you're going to make that mad unit. He steps up to Billy. Yo, brother, you going to be a star? Very cool. That's all you got for me? Congrats. Haters don't hate, right? Like, I care what you thinking. End of you. Dad bailed, you bailed, Mac. You know, like to kick like the crap out of me. And mom sit there and watch. That weak bitch. Say that again. I'll snap your neck. Mo stands. Randy waves him off. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. A little sibling rivalry, right? <laughs> little jealousy. Yeah. That's all it is. 
Randy turns. Mo, go roll a fat one. I'll be uh, in 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 a set. Sure. Uh, he likes to play tough guy because he's a big army man, but he's a pussy. Pussy yeah. cat. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> Mo eyes it's them. Cool. It's cool. Okay. Mo exit with his eyes on Randy and Billy. Randy gestures to the couch. Billy sits. Randy rolls up a chair and sits. He sighs. His face softens. What, what are you doing here anyway? Mom's dead. I heard. What happened? Struck. Billy looks him in the eye. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you should come to the services. I'll think about it. You still stealing cars? Yo, oh, and I'm selling a ton of weed and making more coins than ever. I got way better prices than the legal stuff. <laughs> cha You've got a shot to do something. Don't screw it up. I'll take you down, famous or not. I appreciate the words of wisdom, big bro, but if you don't mind, I got some booming tracks to mix. Randy stands and gestures towards the exit. Great to see you, though. Billy doesn't budge. I got something else. What's that? Mac needs help. Oh, I know. He's a psycho. Financial help. You funny. He kept the family together after Dad left. We owe him a lot. Screw Mac! Dad was a drunk loser, and he will never hit me. Mac used to beat the crap out of me just for the fun of it. It's called tough love. You were a hard kid to control. Yeah, control. Put that little spaz in the special ed and fill him a full of retail and tell him to shut up. Make sure to constantly push his balls about everything and slap him around because he likes music you hate, right? Billy stares. Randy pulls out his phone and starts typing. It is best. He needs you. No, he needs his mommy. Suddenly, the young men from outside bust into the room. One of them wields a gun. Billy pops to his feet. What took you so long? Man, take, the, take him from that ride. Beat the crap out of him and toss him into the quarry. Billy squares up. The young man waves the pistol. Come on, we're going. Don't screw this up, Randy. <laughs> Do you realize who, who I know? Who I own? I am undestroyable, son. One man comes at Billy. Billy drops him. Another comes. The same thing. Captain. You sure about that, son? Forensic evidence is mad tough to clean. Blood smears every last it where? Every last where? You got about a thousand paper towels and five gallons of bleach and six days to clean up time. You got contractor bags? The triple ply? Those are the only ones that don't leak. You better have all that, that son. You're going to be in some mud sad trouble. RJ, yo, he's right. The young man hesitates. Billy is on him. He kicks the weapon away. One punch, one kick, the man goes down. Billy picks up the gun and wipes his brow. Send Mac a check, your whole advance. Then send him a 1500 a month, forever. Don't, and I'll bring you down. You've got a lot of skeletons in a big old closet, son. You crazy. I'll kill you. Billy forces the gun into Randy's hand. He then pulls at Randy's hand and puts the gun to his own head. Do it. I literally have nothing to lose. They stare into each other's eyes. Billy lowers the gun, pulls it from Randy's hand, ejects the ammo cartridge, and tosses it across the room. Then take me down, bitch. I'd rather go to jail for the rest of my life than give Mac uh, one red cent. Billy points the ammo-free gun at Randy and pulls the trigger. It emits a soft click. He drops the gun and exits. Exterior, mom's house, night. 
The street is quiet. A black sedan pulls up and comes to a halt across from the house. Billy peers out from behind a bush in a neighboring yard. The agents step out of the vehicle. Agent 1 stands by the car as Agent 2 approaches the house and knocks on the front door. The house is dark and quiet. He knocks again. Billy watches and waits. Bombs explode in his mind. A flurry of images flash before his eyes. A story swells in his head. Cut to exterior desert day. Billy is in full battle gear. He is crouched behind a bush as several vehicles carry enemy fighters past him on a dirt road. Billy speaks into his radio. I count nine. Over. The voice of his commander comes back over the line. Meet me at the original rendezvous point. You'll take over the bunker from there. Over and out. Wait, it's just me now. What about the team? Over. He is met with silence. He watches as the last vehicle passes. He speaks into his radio. Raven One calling Mongoose. Raven One calling Mongoose. What's going on? The line is silent. Cut to exterior mom's house night. The black sedan revs its engine and pulls away. Billy comes back to reality. Really? He darts across the street and into the backyard. Exterior, back entrance, mom's house night. Billy enters the house quietly. He does not turn on a light. Interior, Billy's bedroom night. Billy gathers his belongings and stuffs them into his bag. He carries his bag from the room. Interior, kitchen night. Billy pulls a soda out of the fridge. He closes the fridge door and steps out of the kitchen. A moment later, he reappears and reopens the fridge. He stares at the cans of beer. He replaces the soda and grabs a beer. Interior, mom's living room night. Billy sits in near darkness, sipping beer. Mac comes down the stairs. Hey. Hey. Mac wanders into the kitchen and returns with a glass of water. Hey. hey. Huh, time to take my meds. Mac reaches for a switch and flips the light on. Shut it off, okay? Sure. Mac flips the switch and sits. He pops several pills into his mouth and chases them with water. This is the antipsychotic. They sit quietly. Did you order that cake? Yeah, a huge one with icing roses. I had to live it with the card and all that. Blessings from the McCarthy family. Sounds really nice. They sit in silence. I'm glad you're here. In the house, I mean. Too quiet. Damn. I miss her. He changes track. There's going to be a million people at the service. Everybody's psyched to see you. Sweet. Billy sips his beer. He stares. I was drinking too much and it was slowing me down. I felt like I was getting weak and crazy like dad, so I quit. You're a grown man. A couple of beers, why not? Think? You're an American hero. You got every right to blow off some steam. Billy sips his beer. You were there when I enlisted, remember? <laughs> Proudest day of my life. A couple of years ago, I got called in. Me and a few guys from my unit. They were men in suits, CIA, NSA. I don't know what exactly, but black ops. They don't tell you and I don't ask. Mac nods. They taught me a lot. Psych ops, interrogation techniques, munitions, extreme survival, hacking. <laughs> Badass. You want me to tell you something crazy? How about this? Billy takes a sip of his beer. One mission, I dropped into a compound for a skylight. I didn't make a sound, some real ninja moves right out of a video game. I slit an enemy's combatant, I slit an enemy combatant's throat with my 12 inch knife. My hand was clasped over his mouth while he bled out so he couldn't make any noise. He couldn't do anything but gurgle. As you might imagine, there's no way to avoid the blood. It pumps out so fast and far since the jugular is so close to the heart. It looks like bad special effects in a movie, cartoonish almost. I was in a puddle about 10 feet in diameter and I let the body drop. 
I was covered head to toe. You have to be careful when you're walking in blood. It's slippery as hell. So here I am, walking out of the blood puddle in these ridiculous looking tiny up and down baby steps. It was like a hilarious, more cartoon stuff. Billy takes a big drink. And of course my extraction got all kinds of foobard. Missiles flying everywhere. No way we were getting helicopter support. So I hid in a sewage ditch for 48 hours, covered in urine, feces, and my enemy's blood, just laying there, waiting, waiting. You ever hear a rat? A toad? Raw. Yummy. Billy drinks. Mac is a guest. The days later, Huey managed to drop in for me. Got back to camp, showered for an hour, scrubs like crazy. My skin was raw, but I still smelled like blood. Not the excrement like you'd think, the blood. Like after you're out drinking all night and you just ooze alcohol from every pore. Today I'm eating, it's a month later, and I swear to God, I smelled his blood under my fingertips. And I could feel the pulse of his heart vibrate through my body. His pulse, thump, 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 thump. Billy slaps along on his leg, thump, 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 thump. Max stares with horror and fascination. Billy shrugs and sips his beer. Give me leave for mum's funeral. I'm AWOL. Mac is perplexed. Why not? It's your mother's, for Christ's sake. There was a raid going down. Supposed to happen today, actually. Small town about 200 clicks west of Kabul. There was a big catch of weapons, so we were told. But I knew it was bull. My CEO, he's dirty. I found out about him on the last mission. I knew this was going to be another mess, putting my boys and a ton of civilians in harm's way. I wasn't going to do it either way. So I stowed away on a cargo plane, hopped a commercial flight. Uh, hours later, I'm here. Mac is flabbergasted. You skipped on a mission? Yeah. Billy stares. But you're a platoon leader. Yeah. If anyone gets hurt, it's on you. 150%. Billy stares. Mac takes a breath. He points to the door. You let your platoon down. You let your family down. You forgot what sacrifice means. I know what it means. I never left mom's side. I gave her everything. You? You crap on the people that needed you most. You're a deserter, a traitor. Get out. Billy stands, Max stares. Billy reaches into his pocket, pulls out the ring of keys and tosses them on the table. He takes his jacket from the back of the chair, exit up the stairs and returns with his duffel bag. Don't be a mom's services. It'll kill us, you know. Billy puts his jacket on. Max starts to cry. Billy heaves his bag on his shoulder, unlocks the door, and exits. Billy, exterior Camille's building night. Billy tra tramps up the steps to Camille's building. The buzzer is smashed. The front door is ajar. He quietly slides into the building. Interior Camille's building sta stairs night. He slinks up the steps while looking about. Interior, Camille's apartment, landing night. Billy slowly tries the knob. It turns easily. He pulls the door open. Interior, Camille's living room, night. Every light is on. The room is disheveled. Drawers are open. Items are tossed about, helter-skelter. Billy heads out of the room. Interior, Camille's bathroom, night. Billy pulls the cover off of the toilet tank. He reaches in and fishes about. He pulls out the aspirin bottle and shakes it. Okay. He drops the bottle back in and replaces the cover. A noise comes from the living room. He quickly grabs a hand towel and wipes the wet tank cover down. He opens the bathroom window, tosses his bag out, and climbs out, still holding the hand towel. Through the front door, the men in black suits appear. Exterior, Camille's backyard, night. Billy drops from the fire escape and darts around the corner of the building. Exterior, Camille's building, night. Billy comes to the front of the building and starts to head away when a woman's voice calls out. 
Really? She sits in a car across the street. Come on. Billy runs to the car and hops in. Interior, Felicia's bedroom night. Ellie and Billy stand in the doorway and peer into the room. Felicia lies asleep in bed. She's beautiful. You sure she's mine? She doesn't look anything like me. Yeah, I'm sure. She's got your eyes. There's Mark. Well, I'm glad I could pass that along. I'm sure she'll thank you. She smirks, he smiles. Interior, Ellie's kitchen, night. Ellie and Billy sit at the table and sip coffee. I always had this fantasy that we would move to Miami. What a life we could have had. When I go with my brother, I feel like a different person. Maybe it's just the weather, the sun, I don't know. But I feel so alive when I'm there. Bitches everywhere. Not like Sophie. She sips her coffee. Billy smiles. Sounds pretty great. You should go to Miami. My brother will let you stay with him. It will take a long time before they think about looking there. We can figure out a plan. No matter where I go in human society, they're going to find me. They need to bring me down. But you're just at a wall. Isn't that like a demotion or something? Tell them about your mom and your brother. They will understand. More. What? I know some really bad stuff. She stares. They sip coffee. I always believed in doing the right thing, or at least I believed what Mac believed, and it was most likely the right thing. I wanted to make him proud, or I wanted to be a leader like he was, or like he wanted to be. I was trying to live his dream for him, maybe. I don't know. I wish you hadn't re-enlisted. I thought I could walk away. Who wouldn't want to be done seeing people getting their heads blown off? It's a cliche, but by now, but it had the hooks in me. The adrenaline, I guess. Every time I started thinking about working some government job or taking classes, it made my head melt. It just seemed like I was giving up. I was going to be home safe while my boys were back there dying. I get it. I hate it, but I get it. I used to believe there was a water fight, but now the picture is super clear. I'm there killing them, but the real terrorists? They're back here, shooting up malls and schools and movie theatres, blowing up churches and temples and waving my flag while they're doing it. Screw that. Suddenly, a noise comes from right outside the window. Ellie freezes. Billy speaks between his teeth. Don't move. Act normal. He raises his voice. I've got to pee. <laughs> Too much coffee. Billy stands and slides out of the room. Interior, Ellie's living room night. Billy slides the sash up and drops out the window. Exterior, Ellie's front porch night. Billy crouches behind a bush. Mo Money stands on the front porch doing his best to peer into the window. Billy is on Mo in a flash, his foot long knife at Mo's throat. Mo gasps. Hi, Mo. It's not what you think. Oh? He presses the knife into Mo's flesh. Some kind of agents were looking for you. Randy told me everything. He ain't doing you right. I want to help. The front door cracks open. Ellie's eyes appear in the open slit. Billy? Billy exhales, pulls the knife away, and releases Mo Money from his grasp. Get in the house, quick. Interior, Ellie's kitchen night. Ellie, Billy, and Mo Money sip coffee at the table. Randy's my boy, and I got a lot of love for him, but he needs to show some respect. He looks directly at Billy. I know where he keeps his money. Okay. I can help you steal it. Okay. My name's Maurice, Mo, hence the Mo Money moniker. I'm not some gangster. My pop's a lawyer. I grew up in Cambridge. That's not what the cracker ass music industry suckers want to hear with their ghetto fetish. So yeah, I tell them I was a dealer and I did time or whatever. They eat it up, idiots. Randy though, he's playing that for real. All I want to do is make music and I know that's what he wants too. This thug stuff is going to screw it all up. And that's why I'm going to help you steal his money. It will prove he's not untouchable like he thinks he is. He stares into space. Those Boston Marathon bombers, they grew up in Cambridge. They went to my high school. 
what I'm trying to say is I got a lot of respect for you and your family and what you did for this country. You put your life on the line for me and other spoiled kids so we can play gangster and try to live a dream while other people are working their asses off just to put a roof over their head. Mad respect. He turns to Billy. My pop's a good lawyer and he was in Desert Storm so he knows the deal. He can get you out of the country to Uruguay probably. His buddy is Edward Snowden's counsel. You learn all the tricks from him. He looks Billy straight in the eye. He looks at Ellie. Are you serious? You'll never be able to come home. Not without being charged, no. You'll be able to visit him? Our daughter will be able to visit him? If you plan it out with the consulate, from what I understand, yeah. Really? I don't know. I'm not sure you want to put yourself in the hands of the US government. They have a way of making bad things happen. I oh, know. He pulls the slip with Camille's address out of his pocket. No matter what I decide, I need you to get something to your father. He hands the slip to Mo. Exterior, park, curb, night. Billy slams the car door and steps around to the driver's side. Ellie is behind the wheel. You can stay with me? They're gonna come looking for you again. I'm surprised they haven't already. They'll never find me here. You'll be safe? In a park in Dorchester? <laughs> I'll be okay. He smirks. You got the address? See you in the morning. Billy steps into the park, dragging his bag behind him. Exterior, Camille's building, night. Mo Money strolls up to the front stoop and climbs the steps. The two agents step out of the shadows. Agent One flashes his badge. ID. You kidding me? This is harassment. ID, please, sir. Mo sighs and pulls out his ID. It's uh, kind of late to be out. No black folks out after dark. You don't want to scare the nice white folks, huh? The agents look at each other. Agent One hands back Mo's ID. What are you doing here? I'm here to see my mother to make sure she's okay after you crackers tore her place apart and dragged her in for questioning. Is that okay? The agents stammer. Go ahead, sir. Sir is right. Trust me, you don't want my lawyer up your asses. The agents back off. Mo hits the buzzer. The door buzzes. Mo grabs the knob and pulls it open. Jerry sure evening, gents. He enters the building and the door closes behind him. Exterior, park, night. Billy strolls through the homeless population of the park. He lightly kicks one old man laying up against a bench. He extends his hand. He holds a hundred dollar bill. Hey buddy, you seen Brendan from the Bronx? The old man gestures. Billy hands him the bill and several others and steps off in the direction indicated. Exterior, park, fountain, night. Brendan sips from a pint bottle as Billy approaches. Hey, Dad. I'm going to give the old man more shit, are you? <laughs> no. I need a place to crash. You want a drink? He extends the bottle to Billy. He takes it, drinks, and hands it back. Brendan takes a long pull and sighs. We're going to buy the house from you. You won the lotto. <laughs> Something like that. He extends his hand and puts it on Brendan's shoulder. Maybe we could structure it so you'll always have a roof over your head. He sips and passes the bottle to Billy. Eh, it's not so bad. It gets cold and wet. Wet is worse. Even if it's hot, you get cold. But you can't put a price on freedom, can you, Billy boy? No. If I work, I work. If I don't, I don't. I got nothing holding me anywhere. Sounds lonely. <laughs> you see, drunks, scumbags, scales, the dregs of humanity. But there's plenty of good men out there, Billy boy. The only difference between you and us and them is that no one that cares about us is no one that cares about us. Brendan gestures towards the men sleeping and drinking around them. He takes the bottle and drinks. So we care about each other. It feels good to belong. It's not a life I would have chosen. I've learned accept it. Why did you leave? You think I'm a bad man? I'm not sure what good and bad mean. 
Am I selfish? You don't want responsibility. Nothing's that simple. You allowed addiction to consume your life. <laughs> Indeed I did. Fighting self-loathing is an easy task. I think you know some about that. You left. Matt made us swear never call him, to never to never call him Brendan or Junior again. He is a prideful boy. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. I dissolve for all the stones that may throw. Why did you leave? What will you do with yourself, Loathing, when it comes to home roosts? It's up to it. That's a crock. Why did you leave? You're making it sound like there's no reason. Mother and brother made me. You're drunk. You're not making sense. They threatened to call the police. Junior threatened to kill me. Brendan Bull. starts to take a sip. Billy grabs his arm. Bull. Brendan pulls his arm away from Billy's grasp and sips. His eyes mist as he stares into the distance. Tired never to have any pure thoughts. What are you talking about? The flesh is weak. What happened? I was in Randy's room. My trousers were unbuttoned. Billy jumps with a start. He's four years old. Billy stands and grabs his bag. Billy boy, don't leave me. You'll get the money. Don't worry. You're no different than me. You'll see what it's like. Billy steps away. Brendan weeps. Exterior, dive bar, back alley, night. Randy and Jim stand beside a BMW. It has a visible dent in the front quarter. Get it out of here. Uh, let's put the dummy place on it. That's why they can't run the... No. Get rid of it. Dump it at the top base center. But what about... Jim forcefully grabs Randy by the shoulders and gives him an aggressive shake. I need to know if you're a moron. Screw you. That's the right motto. It's 10 years old. How am I supposed to? You want to get paid, but you don't want to learn anything about the game. You're a lazy, entitled sack of crap. Randy stares. It's a slight hustle. Why, why should I? Jim smacks him in the face hard. Because you're working for me. Randy's eyes well with tears. <laughs> uh, I, I got a record deal. Every third-rate gangsta in this neighborhood spits rhymes. I'm going to make my money with you or with any other rap stooge of my choosing. It's from the record and company. You got an advance on your future auto sale. That's my money. Didn't your buddy explain that to your dyslexic ass? It's in our services contract, not the labels. I advance you the money. You pay me back when the record drops. No, that's not what. Yes, that's what. They stare at each other. You're nothing without me, Randall. Just another low rent Salvi scumbag. Interior law office morning. Billy, Ellie, and Camille sit at a conference room table. The door swings open. Mo Money leads his father, Maurice Phelps, Sr., Esquire, into the room. Hey, everybody. He looks directly at Camille and winks. Hi, Mom. Good morning, sunny boy. They chuckle. Huh? I'll tell you later. It's my pops. Good morning. I'm Maurice Phelps, senior attorney at law. Junior here tells me you're in some kind of trouble, Mr. McCarthy. You could say that. He smirks. Maurice, you prepared the papers? Yeah. He opens a file folder and extracts some documents and places them before Billy. You prep them? No worries, son. JD, Brenda's law, I got this. The three share surprise smiles. Mr. McCarthy. I can get you to a safe house in Uruguay. You will not be held in limbo at the mercy of diplomats. Okay. From there, we can establish a new identity and a path to citizenship. Citizenship? 
You'll have to renounce your American citizenship, of course, but it's all simple enough. Wait, renounce it? It's the only way to be safe from the overreach of the U.S. government and free from prosecution of any kind. Billy stares them, comes back to reality. Mo, did you get what I asked? Yeah. He fishes the aspirin bottle out of his pocket. What's in it? Feels like a change. He shakes the bottle. Yep. And? Mo, money starts to unscrew the cap. Here, what's this? He holds up a finger covered in a sticky substance. Petroleum jelly, little basic training trick. It's waterproof. Seal a cap with that. Contents are going to be dry as a bone. Mo dumps the contents into his palm, coins followed by the thumb drive. I'm guessing it's a thumb drive and not some expensive ass rare coins you're worried about. Smart man. What's on it? We'll talk about it later, when I get to Uruguay. You are the client. You make the call. Just what I wanted to hear. I have a car with private security ready. They can take you to the airport. A chartered flight is waiting. I've got something I need to do first. He looks to Mo. It's pretty important. You're the client, Mr. McCarthy. You make the call. Exterior, car up the block from Randy's house day. Mo sits behind the wheel. Billy is in the passenger seat. Get out of here. I'll roll up, blow the horn. Randy comes out, we jet. We have at least three hours. We never do mix sessions shorter than that. And you know the money is in the basement? I've never seen it, but Randy goes down there with a bag full of cash and comes back up empty-handed. Okay. When we get back up, I'll blow the horn like a musical rhythm. It pisses Randy off, so I do it all the time. When you hear that, meet me back here. You okay to wait? It could be 10 or 12 hours. I lived in a ditch of sewage for two days. I can hang in a basement for a minute. Mo <laughs> chuckles. You're cool doing this. Bro? He needs some tough love. Look, a lot, I, a lot of guys are after RJ, the destroyer. He'd have literally zero reason to ever think I'd be involved. I'm the least shady out of anybody who knows. Just make sure to break the basement window or do something rickety like one of those dumbasses would. Makes sense. Here we go. Billy opens the door and slides out. He steps behind the car and darts into a neighboring yard. Exterior, Randy's yeah. neighbor's yard day. Billy slinks behind a house. He darts past the sliding glass doors. Exterior, Randy's backyard day. Billy peeks out in front of the house. Mo's car pulls into the driveway. Mo beeps the horn. A moment later, Randy emerges and hops into the car. Mo backs out of the driveway and speeds off. Billy steps behind the house, bends at the basement window, and smashes the glass with a short, quick kick. He opens the window and drops into the basement. Interior, Randy's basement day. Billy rifles through the basement. He opens drawers, looks into cabinets, moves objects out of the way to peer behind them. Nothing. Cut to interior, Randy's basement day. Billy sits on the bottom step of the staircase and looks around the room. His eyes latch onto a panel on the wall. He stands and walks across the room. He pulls out his knife and pries at the edge of the panel. The panel pops off. Billy laughs like a madman. Yeah, poor baby. Billy turns and darts up the stairs. Interior, Randy's kitchen day. The basement door swings open and Billy pokes his head into the room. He steps out of the stairwell and heads to the kitchen cabinet. He opens one, then another. He hunts through the items on the shelves until he finds what he's looking for. A stack of plastic bags. <laughs> he grabs one from the top of the stack and heads back to the basement door. Cut to interior, Randy's basement day. Billy's ear sandwiches the plastic cup against the door of a large safe in the wall. He turns the dial one way, then another. He hears clicking, then a pop. Eight. He continues with the dial. Eighteen. He turns the dial back and forth. Twenty-eight. He pulls the lever. The door swings open. Billy peers in it. It is filled with stacks and stacks of money and several guns. Ooh. He spins around and grabs a laundry bag and starts shoveling stacks of money into it. He pauses and looks around the room. The world speeds before his eyes. His mind fills with explosions, rockets, and screams. The sounds of the world build around him. His hand goes to his temple. His knees buckle. He collapses on the basement floor. Cut to black. 
interior Randy's living room night. The room is dark Can and quiet. Can we pause for just a second? Uh-huh. I just, uh, does anybody need to use the bathroom? Or are we good? Yes, please. Yeah, can we, go ahead. we can take it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Two minute, two minute, five minute break. Everybody Sweet. Take a breather. Okay. Sounds good. I'll literally go and then I'll be back. Good. I'm too old to be holding my bladder. <laughs> good job, guys. Yeah, go, go on, take a breather, make a phone call, whatever you gotta do. Yeah. Oh, everybody's gone. <laughs> James, you're still there. <laughs> I'm still there. Well, dang it. <laughs> it's just you and me. <laughs> Everybody ran. Everybody, everybody, everybody. everybody yeah, I'm looking at a blank screen. It's just you. <laughs> I don't need to. I, I was smart. I went to the bathroom beforehand. Yeah. Bro, sweating over there, bro. I see that shirt. Like, I know. What the hell? Look at this shit, man. <laughs> Dang, oh. bro. This is a, how it should look. And then this is. I, mean, I don't know what it is with my room. Do you, do you not have AC on? I don't have AC. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> what about a, a fan? No fan? I have a fan. I have a fan, but that's it's just doing the bare minimum. Yeah, sorry about that earlier. I was trying to uh, have the fan on me, so I was trying to make sure I wasn't in the audience. Is that what that sound was? I heard it sound a couple times. Yeah, I think the fan be, uh, so I, I tried to keep my audio off as much as possible. This is a good, uh, I like the story a lot. It's very, like, I can picture just about everything that's happening. <laughs> I think even, even Mark left. <laughs> that was fun. You, went to go, you went to go get some more water? <laughs> hey, kids. Hey! Scripts where there's like one central character are easier to follow than ones where there's yeah. like a bunch of different ones. Um, yeah, the multiple stuff is a little tricky, but we, we make it work. It can be tricky, yeah. Yeah. This one just has that one. I think Billy's in every scene, more or less. Yeah, everybody's doing good. Though. As long as we got the main characters, I'm not worried. You know, the small characters. And, like, hey, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Candace is back. The ladies are back. Yes, I am back. Cool, cool. Candace, you're working the. Uh... Working the tongue there, right? <laughs> right, I know. It's a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, everybody just, just take a breather, shake your body up, whatever you got to do. We got Amanda back. Take a sip of water, stretch your neck out. You know. um, and where you left off on page 83, I believe. See yep. right? Yeah, I think it was um, intro Randy's living room night. Correct. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. All the right, room go is for it. the room is dark and quiet. The sound of a car horn blowing and a musical rhythm comes from outside. A moment later, the front door swings open. Randy steps in through the door and flips on a light. He recoils in shock. Billy is seated on the couch. The bag of money sits on the floor nearby. Uh, you, what do you want? I apologize. Randy gestures to the bag. Uh, what's that? Seriously, you need to upgrade to a better safe. That lock is a joke. I cracked it in under three minutes. I could have walked out here with a million bucks. It's more than like two million. Either way, you're an idiot. Why do you think you get to call me that? I'm not stupid. Billy is taken aback. Randy huffs and nonchalantly walks into the kitchen. Randy, hey, I'm sorry. Randy reappears with a soda and a handgun. He is agitated. He points the gun at Billy. You broke into my house and you and are gotta steal my money? Give me one reason why I shouldn't blow your head off. Well, because the cops are going to want to know why you have so much dough lying around. You file your taxes recently? Screw you. But mostly it's because it's not who you are. You're a sweet kid with a big heart. Randy drops into a chair defeated. 
You're not dumb. You're different. You don't need sense beaten into you. You don't need to get yelled at. I'm sorry I rationalized that. Mac was trying to teach you. He wasn't. He was treating you like garbage because he was jealous. You high? You never cared about expectations. You liked what you look you liked what you liked with no apologies. You believed in yourself. That's hard for a lot of people to look at. It just shows them their failures and they didn't have enough sack to pursue their dreams. Billy leans in. Did you ever do it? Did dad ever do anything to you? Like what? You know what I mean? Sexual stuff. No. Not even when you were really little? I don't remember anything like that. I think, I think I would if it happened. I, I remember all the terrible stuff. Yeah. I wonder if dad did anything to Mac though. <laughs> Mac seems like he'd like to take one up the... Don't finish that sentence or I'll smack the taste out of your mouth. <laughs> Sorry. Billy looks into the distance. Mac is now full-blown schizophrenic. You should see what's in the medicine cabinet. You don't owe me anything and you definitely don't owe him anything. But think about all the bad things you've done and think about how you're going to spend some of the money to make something better. Be the person Mac couldn't be, Dad couldn't be, Ma couldn't be, I couldn't be. Protect someone weaker than you. Break the cycle, Randy. Make the McCarthy name better for it. A car horn beeps in a rhythmic matter, pattern. Randy eyes Billy. He rises, steps to the door, and opens it. Mo Money is on the stoop. Yo, you didn't pick up my phone, did you? I can't find it. No. You sure? Check. Randy sighs, reaches into his pocket, and looks at the screen on his phone. Mo makes a facial gesture to Billy over Randy's shoulder. Billy holds up a single finger and mouths the words, one second. Nah, it's mine. All right, must have dropped it at the studio. Peace, bro. See you tomorrow. They bump knuckles. Mo turns and leaves, closing the door behind him. Randy turns back to Billy. So, what do you think? Exterior, car up the block from Randy's house, night. Billy slides into the passenger seat with the laundry bag in tow. You had me scared, son. What were you doing? Being a good brother for the first time. But hey, let's get out of here before he changes his mind. Mo hits the gas. The car pulls out of view. Interior, Randy's living room, night. Randy fiddles with a business card. His phone is pressed to his ear. The name on the card reads Special Agent James Dwyer, National Security Administration. Hey, you can buzz off. I decided I'm not going to help you. I'm, I'm not going to rat on anybody. Exterior, law office day. Billy embraces Ellie and gives her a light kiss on the cheek. He releases her and repeats the same with Camille. He shakes hands with Mo, then gives him a big hug. He shakes hand with Maurice Sr. Let's do this. A limousine pulls up to the curb and stops. A bodyguard steps out and holds the door open. Billy addresses them all. Thank you. He wipes a tear. Spanish is easy to learn. CEO, amo, Uruguay? He smirks and steps into the limo. Exterior limousine day. Billy sits in the traveling car, a large bodyguard on either side. Can we roll down that avenue? Sir, we have been extracted to go. I know. Billy cut oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I know, but the client gets to make the call. Uh, yes, sir. He bangs on the back of the driver's seat and calls to the front. Uh, yo, turn left up here. The car turns left and travels along. Billy looks out the window. Exterior, Bodega Day. The limousine pulls to the curb. The door pops open. Billy steps out. 20 minutes. He hops onto the curb and turns back. Uh, leave the engine running and keep your eye on the front door. We might be in a hurry. He heads to the bodega. Interior, Bodega Day. Billy enters. He grabs a pack of gum and places it on the counter. He drops a stack of bills next to it. The worker is quizzical. Prices aren't that ridiculous. Billy looks around. The back door? Over there? He points. I'm going out that way. 
I want to be able to come back in. Uh, I don't know. There's no handle outside. It's the key. I'd have to prop it open. Uh, but there's these cats. Uh, I'll give you twice as much when I get back. I don't know. Billy heads to the back. The worker follows. 20 minutes. Close if I'm not back. The worker shrugs. All right. And if two guys in suits come looking for me. Interior back room day. Billy pops the door and holds it open. The worker grabs a box and places it in the doorway. Billy lets the door swing closed. It hits the box and remains ajar. Should be good. In a flash. Billy pushes the door open and steps out into the backyard area. The door closes on its hinges but remains ajar. Billy climbs the back fence with ease and drops into the adjacent yard. Exterior side of nearby house day. Billy strolls quickly through a neighboring yard. Exterior alley day. Billy slinks along down the alley and comes out on a busy street. He looks around and steps to the left. Interior funeral home day. A casket sits at the far end of the room. A sign reads Eileen McCarthy, visiting hours 4 to 7 p.m. A small flower arrangement by a casket. Folding chairs fill the room. A side door cracks open. Billy peeks into the room. He comes halfway in and stops well before he reaches the casket. Hey, Mom, it's Billy. Sorry I didn't call you much. Things were always intense over there. I never felt settled. We moved around constantly, and it was hard for me to get out on my own and open up, be in the moment, connect with people, you know? You can relate. We weren't a family that talked. We all knew the expectations. No one ever needed to say a word about them. Looks good, right? Mac did it up real nice. He's always been thoughtful like that. He takes a half step forward. I can't really say I love you or I'll miss you. That distance. I have no idea what your dreams were, if you had a hobby, who your first boyfriend was. You told me to clean my room, I did. You told me to do my homework. I did. Got me Christmas presents. You were proud when I won trophies and when I joined the army. You were pissed when I got involved with my teacher and probably even more pissed when I got involved with a Vietnamese girl. Regular, overprotective, close-minded mom stuff. Here's the best version of a send-off that I've got. I respect you for putting up with all the very difficult things you had to while raising kids in a tough town to raise kids in. I think you did an okay job. Thanks. He shuffles half a step forward. I was planning on dying in a shootout with whoever was coming to collect me. But I found out I have a kid. A daughter. Crazy, right? Too bad you're not around. Maybe we could have sat down for coffee and I could have asked for your advice. What the hell? I don't know about... What the hell do I know about a little girl? Maybe we could have bonded over that and maybe you'd see Ellie and Camille were real people. Not some stupid cartoons that terrified you and that the world was bigger than your little corner of Southie. But that version of reality is obviously not going to happen. I guess that's what makes me saddest about you being gone. The last opportunity to make things right, real, whole. Whatever it is that we're all missing. He slumps into a nearby folding chair. We use these assault rifles. SCAR 225s. They have a very powerful gas piston operation system. You can take down a concrete wall with these bad boys. They are high quality weapons. His eyes fly around the room, religious iconography, flowers, the world speeds around him. My first firefight engaged three confirmed kills, but it was probably more like 10. Hard to tell in all the chaos, things flying around. Anyway, it's tradition in my unit to keep count of kills. You scratch them into the barrel of your weapon. Those tick marks, four lines and a slash through them, five. He draws them out into the air with his finger, four vertical lines with a slash through them. My barrel got covered quick. I still keep track. I know you hate the tattoos. You'd slap me upside my head if you could see my back. So, yeah, ah, uh, that's your little boy now. 268 dead by my hands. Who knows many more when you count civilians. He stands and walks to the front of the room. I lay awake imagining what the hell it's like. Roasting hot, 
the devil poking you in the ass with a pitchfork. I read somewhere that none of that is in the Bible. People made it up for paintings and books, so maybe hell doesn't work that way. We all thought it did. I don't know, but I worry about it. But hey, there's no way I can go to hell, right? I got my mom, the USA, and my boy JC on my side. He makes a fist and gives a statue of Jesus a fist bump. Suddenly, the door to the room swings open. Billy spins. Mac walks into the room along with the funeral director. Mac freezes at the sight of Billy. Excuse me, sir. What are you doing in here? Mac reaches a hand out to stop him from moving forward. It's okay. Um, it's my brother. He can... Hey, can you go call Fisher John and make sure he knows what time to get here? The funeral director looks on with suspicion. I'll be back in five minutes. And uh, check on the flower delivery too, okay? The funeral director eyes Billy and backs out the door. I know you wanted to see mom, but I told you to stay away. I needed one last chat with her. They stare at each other. Sit down for a minute. I'm gonna stand, thanks. Suit yourself. Max slides into a folding chair. It's been a hell of a week. Tell me about it. They're gonna catch you. You can't just disappear. That did. No one wanted to find him. You heard from his lawyer? Yeah. You chased him out because he molested you, not Randy. Max's eyes fall. He croaks out his words. It started when I was 10. How come you didn't tell Ma? I did. She told me she'd keep him away from me. Did she? She tried her best, I guess. When I was 15, I broke his jaw. He left me alone after that. His fabled far bar fight where he supposedly took on three guys. I was thought that was bull. You're quick on the uptake. Thanks. <laughs> I knew he never touched you because you were his favorite, but I caught him in Randy's room. He had to go. He saved Randy, you know that, right? A sound comes from the back. Someone has entered the building. He's in here. Billy pushes by, Mac leaps up to grab him. They struggle. Billy pulls free and darts across the room. The two agents enter with guns drawn. You set me up. You broke the rules. Sergeant William McCarthy, you are absent without official leave and are charged with desertion from the U.S. Armed Forces. Max steps forward. Guys, please, show our mother some respect. No guns. You are charged under provision 505B of the military code, sealing state secrets and reporting troop information to enemy combatants. No. Can't you just, like, escort him out and do it outside? The agents look at each other. Please. Tom Martha, for crying out loud. Do it the right way. The agents look at each other. They lower their guns. Billy, I hope someday you can forgive me. Forgive you, Mac. Come on. The only person I can't forgive is myself. Agent One waves Billy along. Billy yeah. steps forward. The agents separate so he can step between them. From nowhere, he delivers a spin kick to the first agent and a thrust to the throat of the second. They drop. Mac charges him. Don't. Mac freezes. I'll kill you if I have to. I have a daughter now, and I am not letting them get me, no matter what. Mac's eyes drop. Billy slowly backs away, then turns and runs. A shot rings out behind him. Exterior funeral home day. Billy sprints down the block and darts into a backyard. Exterior chase series day. The agent's tail bait. Billy's every move through a local landscape that he knows well, yards, alleys, and buildings. Billy displays his elite training as he quickly climbs fences, hops dumpsters, and dodges traffic. Undaunted, the agents somehow stay, step behind him. Exterior alley day. From his perch on a fire escape, Billy surveys the alley below. He tenses as the agents step into view. They look around. Agent one points. 
Up there. Agent two goes for his weapon. Billy flies over the railing and is up upon them. He drops in and lands a kick to each of their faces. The agents fall to the ground. Agent two is dazed. His weapon skitters across the concrete. Agent one pulls his gun, fires, and misses. Billy kicks the gun from his hand and lands a blow to the agent's head. Agent two appears behind Billy. They grapple. Billy throws him in jiu-jitsu style and finishes him with a chop to the throat. Billy flees. Agent one pulls his radio out and croaks into it. He's coming your way. Exterior yard day. Billy hops a shrub and ducks behind a house. Exterior paved lot day. Billy sprints across the lot and climbs quickly over the fence. Exterior back of bodega day. Billy drops from the fence. He sprints to the bodega's back door. The door is closed. Billy rips at the door's edge. It is closed and will not open. His breath, he, his breath heaves. He grabs his knife and fights with the rim of the door, desperately trying to pry it open, but can't. He looks around. Everything is quiet. He takes a deep breath and steps away from the door. He steps back and turns back to the fence. He climbs it. Exterior, nearby house day. Billy looks left and right. He goes right. Exterior, up the street from the bodega, day. The limo sits at the curb in front of the bodega. Billy comes slowly around the corner of a building several blocks away. He pauses, looks about, then steps towards the limo. He hesitates, then stops. A black car comes barreling up the street. The world whirls about Billy as he freezes in time. The car screeches to a halt. Four new agents hop out, weapons drawn, and approach the limo. Billy drops to his knees, heaving breath after breath. The agents rouse the limo passengers, screaming commands, waving their guns in a threatening manner. Billy hauls himself up and walks away in the opposite direction, drawing deep breath after breath. His pace increases until he is several blocks away. Over his shoulder, the limo passengers are cuffed and stuffed into the agent's car. Billy walks and disappears into the ether. Interior basement music studio morning. No money, Mo Money sits at the console twiddling knobs. Randy appears behind him. Yo, you ready to mix the boxing track, booming track? You know it's fun. Randy flops onto the couch. Dial up, a bad mother humper. I want to kill that. Kill that one day. I got some sweet ideas for that book. Mo pokes about on the computer. Maybe be a smoking hot jam. He hits the play button. Randy's vocals explode over the sound system. Randy starts bopping. Yeah, good thing, bro. Mad respect. Ain't no thing. We're gonna take. We're gonna make a million more and then some. We. We'll buy over way out of the contract with Jim. We don't need him. Just need you and me. Randy smiles. You got it, you bad mother humper, you. Most smirks. The music grows louder and louder. They rock out. Interior diner day. Maurice Phelps Sr. looks up from his menu. Good afternoon, miss. I was hoping you were scheduled to work today. Before him stands Camille, grilling, grinning ear to ear. Look who's here. Can you sit? Just wait a minute, Joe. She slips into the booth. They chatter and chuckle. His hand touches her arm. Interior dive bar day. Ellie tosses keys one at a time onto the bar. Front door, back door, star room. I think. Jim looks at her from behind the bar. What do you think you're doing? I thought I wanted what you want. I don't. She shrugs and smirks. It's popping in Miami. My brother says there's a million bar time. See ya. She turns on her heels and heads to the door. Interior bank day, Brendan McCarthy steps up to the counter. Ron, I'm okay. Good morning. Dean 105. 105, Ken. Page 96 or 95, 97. Page 95. Good morning. I need to withdraw some money. A lawyer set up the account and it's got certain controls on it. So I might need a little help. Let me, sir. Let's see what you've got here. 
Brendan Slides his bank card and ID across the counter. Exterior, mom's house day. Max steps out of the house and onto the front stoop. Birds chirp, a breeze rustles the trees. He stretches in the morning sun. He stands frozen in time as the world speeds by him and the bombs and sounds of his life explode through his ears. In the same way Billy experiences, he shakes his head to clear it. Whoa, better take my meds. He turns to the house as a police cruiser pulls up. Out of the car steps two officers. They are the same cops that are Jim's off-duty cop body cards. Yeah, I got Boston Spine is looking for my brother now. Something like that. Can we have a, a word with you? Sure. Inside, please. The cops gesture as they step onto the porch. Mac leads the way inside, the door closes. In the back seat of the patrol car, Jim slides up and peers out the window. A muffled gunshot rings out, then another. The cops exit the house. They get in the car and drive off. Some steely eyes start starter into the distance. Interior law office evening. Mo calls down the highway. Pops, I'm gonna head out. Maurice Sr. pokes his head out of his office. Before you go, take a look at what's on the on that thumb drive. I know Mr. I know McCarthy. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I know Mr. McCarthy wanted to wait until he was safely out of the country, but we'd best be prepared for anything that comes our way when and if he reappears. Okay. Exterior, side street, evening. All is quiet. Street lights pop on as the desk approaches. A loud grating sound suddenly, a manhole cover pops up and slides across the pavement. Filthy and disheveled, Billy climbs out of the darkness of the manhole. Interior law office conference room evening. Mo inserts the thumb drive into a USB port. A window pops up on screen. The words McCarthy confession appear. The video starts playing. The camera darts out. It's hard to get a bearing until Billy's voice starts. This is Sergeant First Class William P. McCarthy, US Army. The I camera just reveals Billy's face. I just killed a bunch of kids. My CO ordered this. There were supposed to be weapons here, but there aren't. There's a giant pile of money and some gold bars. This was a robbery, not a mission. I am a murderer. The camera whips around the room. Small dead bodies litter the floor. What did I do? What did I just do? Billy sobs and screams out. The camera signals distorts. Cut to black. Credits roll. Exterior, the Bronx day. A grimy city block sits quietly, trash cans overflowing. Overhead, a subway train rattles along elevated tracks. Text appears on screen. The Bronx, six months later. Interior, single room occupancy hotel lobby day. Booted feet step through the door onto a worn and filthy carpet. The feet cross the room to the front desk. A duffel bag falls to the floor. The front desk attendant looks up at the man before him. It is Billy. He is bearded, his hair is grown out. I need a room. It's getting cold. The clerk looks him over. You got money? I can pay a week up front. Okay, 120. Billy digs into his pocket. I heard the fish market hires and they don't ask questions. Tough time of the year right now, but Sally will take care of you if you can. The attendant fills out paperwork. You a drinker? Yeah. Go to the place on the block. Thunderbirds are buck cheaper than everywhere else. Hey. Something else. He leans over the desk and speaks in a loud whisper. I got guys following me. Yeah, sure you do. I might need something for protection. He makes an index finger gun and shoots at the clerk. Yeah, okay. I know somebody. Billy hands over multiple rumpled and dirty bills. Soon. I got you. We're like family here. We watch out for each other. No one else will. Oh, no. Hey, uh, you remind me of this guy that used to come around, Boston guy. Is that where you're from? They chatter. The clerk gestures and gabs as he hands Billy a key. Cut to black, the end. Yeah, good job, everybody. Woo! Oh, <laughs> Woo! oh my goodness, awesome. we did it. Hey. <laughs> This is the this first time we did the actual script. Oh, man. Good job, guys. You did it. You hooked, hanged in there. 
Uh, man, I know I have to give you. I, I was a little late on the bathroom break. I'm, I'm sorry. I was, just, I was just feeling the energy, you know. <laughs> it's okay, Randy. No <laughs> one wet themselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, let's get, in, let's get into it. And, uh, who wants? To, whoever wants to stick around and talk and you know break it down, let's do it. Is uh, Mark still here? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Oh, somebody else is off camera. Okay. All righty. So yeah, if you want to leave, you shall leave now. Appreciate that, ladies and gents. I'm actually gonna have to run away because it's 3:15 a.m. here. I was gonna say it's so late for you right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Good job, JD. Thanks. And I have a and meeting in seven hours, so I'm going to run away. I'll send an email, though, with thoughts. You guys are awesome as brothers. I want to see you in something as brothers, so that's cool. <laughs> yes. Yes, John. He's not there, is he? JD, no, he's not. I'll hit you up on uh, Instagram. Yeah, you clear. Yes. Hey, guys. There. Big catch-ups. Thank, Thank you, catch up tomorrow. All right, guys, JD. thank you for having me. Pleasure to see you all again. Good luck. Hey. Hey. Email's hey. coming. All right, pictures. I'm going to wave until I manage to get out of this Bye. meeting because I never do this. All right, Zaydi. Anybody else like to leave now? I can sit for a few yeah. minutes. I'll probably take off in the Just stay for a few minutes, too. I just, I'd like to hear, Mark, what, what you would have to say from listening to it and hearing everybody with your script. Sure, let's thoughts. hear from Mark. I mean, it's, you know, it's like to, to it, I mean, it's, it's really cool to hear it, you know, in the mouths of actors and not just in your head you know, finally after, you know, like I said, I think I wrote this, you know, the original draft of it, I wrote like five years ago or something like that, probably, probably even more now, actually. And I just started revisiting it again, like last year. So it really hasn't been on my plate. Um, and so, you know, after kind of all this time to see it, you know, come to life, it's really, you know, it's really cool. Yeah, right. yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, it's really, you know, I, I, I I think a lot of the things that, you know, I sort of noticed and took notes on, I would have noticed by reading it too, but I think it's more pronounced to hear people kind of, kind of doing it and, and, um, you know, feeling, feeling the different energy vibes of the characters and how some of the words, you know, feel and work or don't, you know, work as well as intended or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really, uh, it's really great to have, you know, to have that experience. So thank you. Really good, really good job. And, uh, it's uh yeah it's a lot of fun so thanks i appreciate it um so we'll see you know we'll see what next steps are right we're gonna try and uh there, um we know, some, we know some people in boston who you know are maybe interested in in trying to try to do something with it so we'll we'll see what happens you know that's kind of the next the next step so does the story continue I mean, it, 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 it's kind of built for part two, right? You know, and, you know, we're in obviously the cable TV generation now, so maybe it turns into a series. Um, mm. I, I really see, you know, there's, I like building characters when I write. I hate films that are kind of just like one character. And to me, all of these characters are really alive and really have something kind of important to do in the story. And like, I love Randy. Like, I want to, I want to do something with Randy. Like, I want to. Supporting characters had a lot to yeah. offer. His own movie, yeah. you know. I really yeah. like the, the brother relationship. The brother yeah. relationship. I want, I want to see Mac. And, I want to see Mac and the mom before she dies too. You know, mm -hmm. uh, just like what what that was about and what their you know was their relationship weird? Was it okay? Was he super needy? Was it just a really tight relationship? You know, what's what's that all about? So yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think I want to maybe include include the mom in this too. You know, it 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 read with the bathroom break and you know two hours, right? Which is like you know it's long. That's long for a feature film, especially in indie nowadays. You know, I mean, maybe if we're able to cast it with stars, it's you know that's a whole different thing. But two hours is long for an indie an indie feature. So I don't know if anything can get added, but you know it's ready for it's ready for a sequel, I guess, right, or a series treatment, or you know. <laughs> now the, I was gonna ask because um, one thing I thought could have been explored a little more, in my opinion, was the relationship between Jim and Ellie and kind of Jim's whole character. Yeah. Because yeah. I did kind of feel like at the end when she just walks out on him and he's just kind of left there with his tail between his legs. Were you, are you planning on exploring, on including him in a sequel or any kind of? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, in my mind right, right now, 
um, if there is a seek, you know, if I start doing that or start doing another episode or, you know, whatever it is, um, I think that Billy is not in it for a bit. You know, he's doing his life outside of, you know, hiding away, right? So he's not, well, he'll, he'll he, you know, he could certainly be in it, but he won't be involved in sort of the, the selfie angle. So maybe that's, uh, maybe that's Randy, you know, figuring out, solving the mystery of who, uh, who killed Mac and, um, you know, how he's going to exact revenge on Jim and, you know, is his rap career going to make it or is this going to destroy him? And, you know, I love, I love the, I love Randy and Mo and Mo too as, sort of the buddy duo, you know? So, yeah. um, I mean, I, I love all these, I really do love all these characters and I think there's, you know, a lot of room for all of them. And I want to sort of flesh out, you know, Camille and Ellie a little bit more because they're not really doing too much. Um, I would love to give them a little something else to do. But again, you know, if we're, you know, if we're at two hours, like what what happens to, you got to cut something if you're going to fill something out, you know? So we'll, we'll, we'll see, I'll keep, Keep working on it, you know. Cool. I, I think that with all the visual, it wouldn't be actually two hours, maybe. Because yeah. of the probably a little, you know, a little bit less, but you know, it's you know they say a page a minute, but it's not a page a minute, you know. It really, it's 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 longer, you know. It really is. Um, I shot a hundred and ten pages from my other feature, and it was. Um, how long was the rough cut? I think it was two hours and 15 minutes or something like that on 110 pages. My so that's, that's um, you know, 135 minutes versus 110 pages. So it's not, you know, it's not a page a minute, you know, and a lot, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the action descriptions too are that take a minute. It's not just a shot, right? It's like he goes into the fridge, he pulls out the stuff for the sandwich, he puts it on the counter. So even like, that's creepy, um, <laughs> the giant head. Um, so even stuff like that, it's gonna, you know, it plays out kind of really quickly in the, in the action description, but in real, you know, in real time on the screen, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be three times or four times as long, really, once you kind of see everything happening. So, I mean, I did really locate a number of things that I, I feel are either literally repeated or at least thematically repeated that can, you know, get chopped out. So maybe that's a page and a half, you know, at the end, at the end of, at the end of those revisions. Um, I feel like there's maybe a little bit, uh, you know, some of his, uh, you know, his speech to mom probably can get whittled down a bit, you know, kind of all the core ideas are there. He doesn't need to say all of these things, you know, we kind of get the idea of, you know, he's trying to figure out how to, how to live, you know, how to live his life after being in this family that had no emotional closeness whatsoever. And so, you know, I don't think we need to see here all the details of, you know, you did this mom and you did that and, you know, all of that kind of thing. So thank you very much. Leave if you're going to leave. I see you. Are you going to? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. Man. Good job. Appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I think I can thin it out and, um, and then, you know, see what happens from there, you know, probably, you know, you probably shoot more pages than you want to shoot every single time. It, you know, it, it plays differently on screen than it does on the page, right? Like you can you can take out a line just from somebody's expression, and you know, right. you're, not, and you're not going to get that on the page, right? No matter what you're doing on the page, you're not going to see it until the actor reacts that way on screen, and then you can say, you know what, we don't need the next line because that reaction really told us the story of what that next line is. So I think you always kind of, you know, shoot more than you need. Um, but yeah, I have, you know, I have some ideas to thin it out and, um, street, you know, streamlining some of the dialogue. And, you know, unfortunately it really, again, it doesn't, you know, you take out a line and you take out another line and you take out another line and you take out another line and the length of the script doesn't change, <laughs> you know, like because of the formatting, right? It's like, you know, it's it the the mar you know the margins are such and there's always the you know the spaces between the you know the blocks of text and stuff like that so you really got to start chopping stuff to see really kind of meaningful changes you take out a line a line a line a line a line through the whole script and you you know you lose like three lines at the end of it. so <laughs> you think you think you're cutting all this time and you're not you know but uh that's that's the process that's the process so I really like the script mark. Thank you. Um, 
the story with Billy seems really intriguing just to show like his PTSD, some of the flashbacks. Yeah. Um, and then how he was snapped back to reality. I thought that yeah. was really great. And, and then and playing a schizophrenic. He's potentially schizophrenic too, right? It is kind of the, is this the onset of his schizophrenia too, is kind of the idea behind it. And uh, is the alcohol going to help set it in motion? Maybe, you know, as he's back drinking. Um, so to me, that's kind of the, the kind of trick in there too, you know? Yeah, schizophrenia is hereditary. Yeah. So it could be interesting if his mom had it, schizophrenia. Yeah. Like if his mom is a schizophrenic, that might be an interesting part because it's her it's hereditary disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean it's you know like I said before, like I don't I don't really know what inspired me to write this version of the story, but you know kind of all the all the elements are in there are sort of my you know my life and people I know and and you know growing up in very much the household that he describes to his mom where there's not any kind of emotional closeness and you, you don't really feel like you know your parents at all as people. You just know them as authority figures. And, you know, we, you have the, you know, the young guy who's kind of describing his version of, you know, how he's going to raise his kid. He's right. He's like, well, you can't be a hard ass, but you can't be their friend. It's got to be something in the middle. It's got to be something where you're teaching and guiding, but you're still pushing for them to, to succeed as a real person. Um, so that, you know, that's a really important story element for me. And that is definitely stuff, you know, from my life and romantic entanglements, right? I, you know, we all have kind of like, how, how do you figure out who the person is that you're, that's the right one for you, you know, for, for some people, it's, it's not that easy and, you know, troubled relationships and, uh, and uh, maybe falling for the wrong person in the first place. And um and certainly the kind of the overarching ideas of, you know, Mac is very much, he reads the rules and he follows the rules. That's how he knows life, right? Like somebody instructed him and he's going to trust in that authority and he's going to do what the doctors say. He's going to tell the agents that this isn't the right way to do it. Like he knows what the right and the wrong way is for everything. Um, and Billy is growing beyond that, has grown beyond that, right? He wants to say, hey, I'm the master of my own life and what do I need to do to make my decisions and are the authorities telling me the correct things? Um, and I think that, you know, I think those are questions that a lot of a lot of people ask in the world of politics today or, you know, just kind of as we're uh, changing over generationally too, you know? Um, Thank you. All right, Joe. Thanks, guys. Really great job. I really appreciate it. So yeah, just that, you know, that kind of world of ideas is, uh, I don't know, all that kind of stuff is in sort of everything I write in, in one way or another, you know, it's like, they say, write what you know, or whatever. And it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be a character, you know, but you know, it's like the emotional spaces that you know, right? The emotional worlds that you know. So that's what I'm trying to do, I guess. Well, it was great. It was fun to do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys uh, doing it. Like it's, it's like, again, it's really, it's really cool to see it come to life. And, you know, it's really helpful to, to hear the characters come out of people and not just what's in your head version of it. Right. It's a real live breathing human saying the words and it, it means something really different than just seeing it on the page and just tick, 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 again. So. Yeah. Type right Good job. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, All right, guys. Well, I have to go as well, but um, right. thank you. And it was nice meeting you, Mark. And I oh, appreciate good it. Good to see everybody. And, and um, all right. Talk to you later. Later. Yeah, I'm happy to wrap. If you guys want to wrap, or if you want to chat some more, I can chat some more too. It's up, it's up to everybody. I think there's a couple people that I want to talk to. Maybe one or two. <laughs> Yeah, brothers, do you guys got anything? Or are we done here? Are you are you originally from Boston, Mark? I'm from Rhode Island, um, but certainly um, a really good friend of mine who my other Boston-based feature, um, it was really based on his life. Um, oh, okay. He was, you know, he was a Dorchester, you know, tough kid. Um, 
So I, I know a lot about, you know, I know, I kind of know a lot about that world and, you know, where I'm from is a little bit more the burbs um, than sort of like Southie, but there are a lot of kind of the elements of that that working class emotional, you know, that was my dad in a nutshell, right? Just like this working class emotionally cut off guy who just like went, went to the bar after work every day. And that was, that was his life. And, you know, sort of half my world was that because half of my family was that and half of my world was kind of more just like regular burbs kind of, you know, middle-class kind of life. So I kind of, I think I maybe see it with a different perspective than somebody who, grew up directly in that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It's, got, it's got like a little bit of a different flavor to me. So I understand it in my way. And, and I think that's why I'm, you know, sort of telling this story about people who are, they, they want to change, they want to change that. They want to, they want to figure out how they can care for folks emotionally and not just be kind of this muscle flexing authority figure. Um, and, you know, personally in my life, having seen that all around me, I, you know, I don't think it works just to be an authority figure. I think you really have to connect with people to get them to believe in you um, and believe that you're invested in them for your words and actions to have any effect on them, you know? And so I get, I mean, I guess that's the whole, that's the whole theme really of the story, you know? It's like, um, Billy wants to change and he's trying to bring, you know, Randy along with him and, uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think we both see them in, in different lights, especially Randy by the end of it, you know, cause he's such a, he's such a, you know, sort of, uh, buying the, buying the hype of what the persona is. And, you know, like, I, I don't know if you guys necessarily saw that in the text, but you know, Randy's act, he's acting until he sits down and starts really talking to Billy, then he kind of just goes into real life. But before that, he's like doing the, you know, hey, I'm over the top hip hop guy. And then when he sits down, he's like, oh, what's the deal? So it's like, he's kind of throwing the switch because he wants to really kind of go in that direction of, you know, as Mo describes what the sort of the record guys are looking for, the persona that they're looking for. Randy wants to kind of live that in a way to, I guess, to get that authenticity to put it in his music to make it more real or something like that when, you know, he's got his own real stories and real messages to tell about his own life that it doesn't have to be, you know, constructed out of this, you know, kind of cartoonish, you know, gangster rap world or something like that. Right. So, so to, I, you know, to me, that's, that's like, uh, I don't know. So it's just sort of about growing, you know, growing up and, and seeing what, uh, where you are now and, and how, how you can change, you know, change what you've learned in, in the past. And, um, and, you know, I was never able to make that sort of conversion with my parents, you know, like they both died before we ever really kind of got to a point where they knew me as a real person and not just their kid, you know, and I certainly never got to know them as real people. So that's, you know, they were just my parents. They weren't like people that I really knew and, I certainly never knew who my mother's first boyfriend was or what her dreams were, like any of that, you know? Um, so that's, you know, that that's all in there. And I think, you know, I, I, it's, I don't know, I think it's shit that just hits you too as middle age <laughs> comes along too. It's like, you know, you start thinking about these things. You're like, you know, who am I? Am I, am I still 25? Am I 50? Am I, what am I going to be like when I'm 75, you know? So I think, yeah, I think it's all, all of that. I think it's interesting, like you said, you, did, you didn't remember uh, when you wrote it, right? And yeah. you, I can say that you never know who your story is going to touch. Because I'm, there are many people who are going to identify with that. Even the story I was picked by, uh, by Randy to play a person who is, my middle name is Ellie, by the way. And mm -hmm. the story is very similar to my own story with my husband and PTSD and going to Iraq. So okay. I fascinating and you uh, that's it like you, you really don't know who is going to identify and i'm sure too that there's gonna be other people who is going to take into their lives see themselves in other characters like i saw myself in the character i was cool. no, I mean, you know i try and make i try and write and make stuff that i want to see you know like 
I don't watch Avengers movies, you know, like, like it's a, it, that stuff that doesn't really do anything for me. I want to, I want to have people discussing life, you know, mm-hmm. complications of life, you know, and that, that's stuff that everybody, yeah. can do, you know. Nothing wrong with that, but giving them the truth, you know, hey, yeah, having yeah. a conversation. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, there's so much, there's so much fantasy back in the world of film now. And, you know, I know that it, it started out that way. It started out as a spectacle, but then it really became, you know, about telling really kind of emotionally true stories. And, and yeah, that's, that's what I want to try and put back out there, you know, and certainly I'm, you know, I'm not the only one doing it. There's a lot of people that are trying to make movies like that, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I, you know, that's where I sit on the spectrum and, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe give a little bit of a, a different viewpoint than maybe somebody else has, you know, I have, obviously we all have our own take on anything and, and the more able you are to kind of solidify your experience into the words, you know, the more, the more you're going to have sort of your unique perspective that maybe, uh, maybe says it in a different way than somebody else ever, ever would have thought, you know, it's like, you know, I, I like the way he talks to his mom, you know, and like, I, I haven't heard anybody say anything like that before in a movie, you know, so maybe that's my original thing that I bring to the table. I don't know. But that's what I, you know, that's what I would have said to my mom, you know. Anything else, Amanda? No. <laughs> uh, Ron, did you want to say something? Or? No, I, I got the the uh, answer that I was looking for. Okay. Ken? Yeah? Sure, Ken? a little quick. Uh, first off, Mark, thank you for sharing. Um, and I... Uh, and I uh, really appreciate uh, the emotion all the readers put into into this tonight. Um, and I, I I can understand what you're talking about about not remembering writing this story because I'm guilty of not remembering any of the stories I write. And um, but I also really dig the fact that you're so in touch with every character that you want to see them have their own their own story and i believe that's because it's either something that is inside of you that they're either a part of you or someone that you know really close that you care about and probably uh, probably. yeah and uh, i think that's all i got to say tonight they just i don't know they just all feel like real people to me and i like i want to meet them you know what i mean like i want to meet every one of these characters you know and like it, it would be I don't know that would be like really you know if you I guess if you get one wish you know like be like yeah, I'd love to meet the characters from my you know my script or <laughs> whatever like that'd be really cool to do that but yeah I don't yeah I, I mean I guess they're I don't know if they're necessarily people that I know really well but you know I want I'm the only reason I'm a good writer at, at all is because I'm really good at watching people and really good at sort of getting energy from people and sort of figuring out who somebody is um, and kind of being able to put that into their dialogue and, and some of their mannerisms and stuff like that, you know, like, I'm not like, I don't think I'm a good writer, like writer, writer. I don't find the best words necessarily, but I think I can identify what this guy's deal is. You know what I mean? And, um, and so I watch everybody around me and what's their deal and, what are they looking for out of life? What are they trying to get? How are they trying to treat me? What are they trying to get out of me? What are they expecting from me? And I think all of that kind of gets recycled, you know, into these people. And um, yeah, then you, you know, then you take them and amplify them a little bit and, you know, make his, you know, 40 year old, te- you know, 40 year old lover, a uh, former teacher, just to add another level of, you know, weirdness and intensity upon it. And, it gives her an extra reason to be angry because not only did she get screwed over by him, she got screwed over by the entire town, you know? Um, so you take, you take the reality and you, you know, you amplify it a little bit and uh, without, you know, without doing it too much. Right. Cause then it feels cartoony or whatever. Um, but yeah, something, yeah, something like that. So, yeah. Okay. You guys got any more questions? Are we, are we good? We can shut it down. A lot of heart and soul in your work, and I appreciate that. It was fun to do. Thanks. I really I appreciate you guys doing it. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for being here. Um, 
This is awesome. You know, I'll send you the recording, obviously, um, so you can look back on it and all that jazz. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you ever want to do this again, just let us know. And, okay. Uh, yeah. I was going to recommend my friend, but his thing is, you know, super uh, R-rated all over the place. He can't. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I, I keep it, yeah, see, you know, in this group, yeah. So. It's just ridiculous over the top. Uh, comedy that we're trying to trying to get going it's it's completely absurd and it's uh yeah it's catalogical and sex jokes non-stop and the whole nine yards so it's definitely not yeah, <laughs> yeah you gotta find another group for that one <laughs> that goes that's the one that's kind of moving furthest along at the moment so, yeah okay yeah. Cool, cool all right guys well have a good night thanks a lot Randy. Thank you guys. No really such a great job Bye, guys. Have a great night.